This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, Douglas Tuman chats with Desiree. Desiree runs Crypto Ramble, a podcast and web series geared towards educating people on cryptocurrencies, specifically coins that focus on privacy. This week's episode is a bit different as Douglas and Desiree interview each other on their journeys into the crypto space the importance of privacy, as well as which cryptocurrency is truly performing as digital cash. Douglas argues that any coin that does not have privacy built into its protocol is not fungible and therefore should be termed a surveillance coin. Douglas states that unlike Bitcoin, Monero has the ability to be considered digital cash due to these attributes. Desiree argues that although some people have become aware that Bitcoin is transparent and lacks privacy, it may be difficult to change their minds to other coins due to Bitcoin's loyal followers and growing network effect. Desiree also discusses Particle, a decentralized marketplace, and her book, The Privacy Coin Guidebook, which digs into different privacy coins. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Desiree, thanks for coming on, or thanks for letting me come on your show. Not sure which one it is, or it's both. How you doing? I'm doing good. I, I think it's going to be both. And we're just going to be talking about privacy, privacy coins, Monero. I'll probably mention Particle and we're going to go back and forth about it. Okay. So do you want to give a quick intro of yourself for, for my viewers? Yeah, sure. I, I can start first. So my name is Desiree. I run a crypto and privacy related YouTube channel and podcast uh, called Crypto Ramble. There's also a website. I uh, also wrote a book that I brought, brought with me on privacy coins. So I'm really into not so much the technicalities, even though I've done some research on that, but how the space is going to evolve when it comes to privacy coins. That's mainly what I talk about. Sometimes I talk about big events. I also run a political uh, podcast and YouTube channel as well. And uh, only sometimes I will, I will mention that I do the other. So if you go on any one of my channels, you will, if you look, you will find um, the, all the other things that I do. So I'm really here about crypto and privacy, um, wrote a book, and I'm a, big fan of a, I'm a big fan of a particular privacy coin called Particle, which uses the technology that Monero uses. Um, which is Ring CT, except it's built on Bitcoin. So it's not exactly the same. It's also proof of stake, but there are some, a little bit of similarities there in terms of how privacy is implemented on a, a blockchain. Uh, so that was my intro. And if you could also tell my audience who you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, not used to introing myself. So uh, Doug Tuman, uh, or, or, or known as Chowbunga Man on Twitter and Reddit. Uh, long story there. I won't get into the Chowbunga Man story. Um, but yeah, I run the Monero Talk uh, YouTube show uh, where we talk about all things Monero. Obviously, we talk about uh, privacy issues at large as well. Um, but yeah, Monero Talk is all about the exploration of uh, finding out which cryptocurrency is truly performing as digital cash is, is the way I like to look at it. So I'm a digital cash maximalist and uh, I currently believe Monero uh, is, is the best coin uh, for that purpose, for, for carrying out the uh, ideals of, you know, uh, the, the cypherpunk ideals and, and actually following through and, and acting as true digital cash. All right. I, um, so I met Doug at the Magic Crypto uh, Conference last year, but I just realized I don't actually know your history of how you got into crypto. And I'm curious about that. Uh, you know, just just kind of a, I'm just kind of a nerd at, at heart. So uh, um, my, my day job completely unrelated to crypto. Um, 
I'm actually in a civil engineer and an attorney. Uh, I'm in charge of the infrastructure for a very large municipality uh, in New York. So completely unrelated to crypto. Um, but I was always interested in uh, disruptive technologies and and um, on the side I had at one point experimented with the concept I called Gov Together, which was basically experimenting with improving representative democracy using technology so that uh, constituents would be able to more directly participate in how legislation was passed. So trying to improve, uh, make representative democracy more direct, so to speak, by using technology. And that was in like 2000 and nine maybe um so while i was doing that i ended up at meetups in new york city where people uh eventually brought up the term bitcoin and that was probably the first time i heard about it fortunately did not did not get involved at that stage because i was i was too into my my own side projects uh but that kind of <laughs> opened my eyes um and uh, actually, even before that, I had thought about like the concepts of digital cash. I was like very interested in that. I had often thought about uh, how great would it be um, uh, if you can, you know, go to your local 7-Eleven and buy a, a card with cash and then use that to somehow transact online. So like cash for the Internet, not not knowing what all the actual hurdles were and, and how you would actually achieve that. Um, and when I first heard of Bitcoin, I didn't realize Bitcoin had actually solved that problem. Didn't put two and two together. So it wasn't until um, around uh, 2000, late 2013 that I actually said, hey, let me let me take a deeper look at this stuff. I keep hearing about Bitcoin. I just assumed it had attempted to be digital cash, but that it was centralized and was was inevitably going to fail like everything else. I had heard about the earlier attempts, the more centralized versions, and saw them come and go, and I assumed Bitcoin was just that. Um, and what I actually ended up buying first, which you probably wouldn't believe, is is Dogecoin. So um, wow. it was like, it was uh, December 2013. I was like, oh, I, mi I missed the Bitcoin boat, so still haven't, didn't really like read the white paper at all or anything at that point, just knew Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm like, let me buy some Dogecoin. Maybe you'll, you know, pump, you know, 20 X or something. And I bought that on Christmas Eve. Uh, and I remember I woke up Christmas morning to, to check my, my Dogecoin. I had it stored on an online wallet, a web wallet, which, uh, anybody in crypto today should know that that's like the number one thing you shouldn't do. So, uh, I bought this Dogecoin on Reddit. I, I used like PayPal to buy it off of somebody. It was like $50 worth. And I woke up the next morning. I went to check my, my web wallet and all my Dogecoin was gone. It was, it wasn't there. And I was like, I was like, huh, this is, uh, this is what crypto, like this, this doesn't make much sense. Like this can't be what the technology. I'm like, I, I obviously must be missing something or not using it right. I mean, how could, how could Bitcoin have this value? I, cause I think at that point, Bitcoin was valued at like, Maybe if that like that was like the first like, you know, real mega pump. It was like maybe like, you know, that like a thousand dollars at that at that time. I was like, there must be much more to the technology. So that's what actually prompted me to then start to research Bitcoin. Uh, and I went down the rabbit hole eventually, you know, listened to the Andreas Antonopoulos videos, uh, read the white paper. And that's when I was like, oh, OK, it's decentralized. You know, like I didn't even, you know, you didn't. I didn't even really fathom the concept of what decentralized truly meant until I got into Bitcoin, like what that really truly means. And so that was a big eye opener for me. And then I quickly, you know, became a Bitcoin fanatic and I guess a Bitcoin maximalist, so to speak, at one point. And I delved deeply yeah. down that rabbit hole and ultimately arrived at Monero once I, 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 I realized that Bitcoin uh, was lacking one fundamental element of digital cash which is you know the fungibility and uh uh to this day I, you know I, I don't think bitcoin is fungible i think it's kind of a critical flaw that it has uh because of the transparent uh blockchain and that's what brought me to monero so kind of a long that story but that that that's that is the full story
that that was really interesting to hear. Um, I I was wanted I want you to say the term that you used the first time we tried this interview because we tried it before and my internet was really bad. Um, you said that you didn't consider any any other any coin that didn't have privacy or I guess isn't fungible. Um, you use a term for it. You call them surveillance coins. And I just thought it was really funny that you call every other coin that. Can you just talk about that a bit? And you already mentioned it, but talk about like realizing when you realize that Bitcoin wasn't digital cash in the sense that it doesn't have this feature that most people aren't don't really think in depth about. But when you you hear the term currency, you think about currency that already exists for most of us, and that is fungible. And so when people hear the term digital currency, they automatically attach that feature to it. But then you realize when you if you ever take the time to look into it more that actually it doesn't even have this thing that you would think is fundamental to to a currency. And I'm not going to say that it's not a currency like it's, it is tracking the exchange of value, blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's not like what most people think of. So can you talk about, you know, like that realization some more? Yeah. So, I mean, um, what, what I don't understand is, you know, kind of the, the notion of privacy coins. So like privacy cryptocurrencies, uh, in my mind, a true cryptocurrency is, is obviously going to be private. So, uh, it's, it, or I see the first killer app of crypto being digital cash and, uh, cash is, is fungible. Cash is innately private. Uh, we don't call it, you know, there isn't cash and then privacy cash. There's just cash. And, and one of its elements is that it's, it's fungible and private. So I see, you know, true cryptos, uh, being something like Monero and, uh, everything else that doesn't, uh, have those attributes, uh, potentially being a surveillance coin. So I, 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 you know, I think that's kind of a better way of looking at it. So, you know, Bitcoin, uh, is built on a transparent, uh, ledger. It's, it's a surveillance coin in that, uh, it can easily be surveilled. Um, uh, and Monero doesn't have that, doesn't have that attribute. It's, it's true digital cash. So that, 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 that's my take on that. I understand that people use privacy coins because it's just kind of like, you know, an easy way of explaining it, but I think it's unfortunate that we're that that's where we're at. That we categorize these things as privacy coins uh, because they're right. really just true cryptos. That's what cryptocurrency is supposed to be. Uh, like I said, it's like calling it privacy cash, uh, and it kind of gives it um, you know a negative connotation, right? Uh, obviously, I'm a true uh, believer in privacy, and I see that it's as like a fundamental right. Uh, but unfortunately, when you say things like that, it sometimes has a negative connotation. Like, oh, well, why do you need to do private things? Uh, obviously, I, I don't, I don't believe in that viewpoint, but I don't even think we should have to fight that battle because I think it should just be called cryptocurrency and Monero is a true crypto and it's digital cash. I definitely agree with the, the sentiment that it shouldn't be like something fringe you know it shouldn't be that you you have to put the qualifier before it um but the it's it's however it's like language in that even though you can argue all of those semantics if the general population i guess in this scenario if the general crypto uh population this decides to call these set of coins that just because of the nature of them being altcoins, like Bitcoin being the first, and then them having privacy coins, having a certain feature, and that's the distinctive feature. Then, even though we can, I agree with what you're saying that they're really just cryptocurrencies. If everybody else calls them privacy coins, then it's like you you can't fight the wave. You can't, you can't fight the wave of people, even if if you go down to the details, it doesn't make sense. Uh, to call it that. So that's kind of just a comment. I don't know if you want to respond to that. Like something else that I want to ask you if you if you don't want to respond to that. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, I think you can I think you can fight the wave. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, we're not talking about, you know, thousands of years of, of, of the use of these terms. I mean, crypto's only cryptocurrency has only been around for 10 years. Uh, I still think we're in kind of like the early phase. Uh, 
you know, Bitcoin maximalists will have you believe that, um, you know, Bitcoin is already the gold standard, which I think is a little ridiculous considering the technology was only unleashed, uh, whatever it is, 10, 11 years ago. And um, we're still in that experimental stage. So I still think there, there is time to kind of set, uh, what, what the words of the industry and what things should be called. And, um, that's why, you know, I think, calling Bitcoin a surveillance coin is, is a good thing to say and to get the word out there and to try to kind of uh, change the perception and have people looking at it that that way. Because uh, that is that is the correct way to look at it in my mind. And I think I think you'll start to see that that meme uh, spread. And at the end of the day, that's what all these things really are. Right. So Bitcoin is really the currently the most popular meme that's out there in terms of uh, a, a, a protocol that people are using for transacting value, um, but it's uh, it's a it's a surveillance coin at the end of the day. So I mean, like I, I feel like right? Do you do you do you hesitate using the term? I I, I don't know. There there seems to be uh, I I, just I like there's hesitate. a negative connotation <laughs> to privacy coin. There's obviously a negative connotation to surveillance coin. I think much much more negative, right? So uh, privacy privacy coin. Yeah. I ultimately think is a very positive thing. Uh, but there is a certain sector of people who will have you believe, well, there's a lot of dangers that go along with that. Uh, surveillance coin is, is clearly a negative. There's the, clearly a negative kind. Con- but you could, you could see the positive there too, right? Surveillance coin is great. I mean, if you want to see everything that everybody's doing and, you know, there are certain attributes to that, right? So if you live in a world where, uh, you know, not saying I want to live in this world, but you can, you could, uh, say, you know, if, if we live in this world where everybody was using Bitcoin and it was perfectly transparent, uh, you know, maybe there, maybe there would be less crime, right? Because, uh, it'd be very hard to get away with things. Certainly it may be more difficult for governments to get away with things, but you got to think of what you're also sacrificing there. You're ultimately sacrificing, uh, human individuality at its core, right? Because if everybody's sur- being surveilled 24 seven, uh, it begins to erode away at what true human individuality is all about. Um, so certainly more of a, uh, a true crypto believer and I see Bitcoin as a uh, surveillance coin and I don't think it's too late to change the terminology and to get the true messaging out there as to what these things should be called. Yeah, well, I'm corrected in terms of the the length of time. Like it has, it, you're right, it hasn't been that long since uh, Bitcoin came out. So it's it's definitely not too late to to change how people speak uh, about these topics. And I do think that uh, cryptocurrencies that aren't fungible, um, like their transparency can be very useful. So I don't think that like the regular people who are just using it for day to day for buying and selling or trading, trading or exchanging uh, money with each other, that they shouldn't have privacy. But sometimes you, you mentioned government, sometimes for businesses, it might be useful to be able to track everything from afar. So that can be good. Um, I would say that I don't like the, the term surveillance coin, not because I, I think you're right, like they are surveillance coins. And if you think about why people call privacy coins, privacy coins, like if, if you're going to put the, the word privacy before it, then you could put the word surveillance before other coins too. But surveillance, I think, has more of a negative connotation than privacy. And surveillance, is like you could also say like the, you could call them tra- transparency coins, um, but that's not the real reason why I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say it just because I don't want to offend anyone. And I know that's like not a great reason, but that is really the only reason that I'd like not bother to say that because they they do allow people to to be tracked, and I'm not a fan of that. And I also you know care about privacy, so that is the truth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my, yeah. my response to that would be, uh, you know, I, if it offends people, I mean, that, that's unfortunate, but that's, I think, what we need to do. If you, if you truly understand this technology and you understand why it's important for a cryptocurrency to be fungible uh, and private, then you should be out there criticizing these other projects that aren't doing that, especially if they're if they're getting momentum and getting network effect because the the end result with that is quite scary i mean if a surveillance coin ends up becoming the backbone of you know 
the, the future global financial system, I see that being as a very scary scenario. It's kind of like we're at, we're at this crossroads, right? So, you know, the, the original pitch with Bitcoin, at least my understanding of it was, was, you know, this, from this cypherpunk, uh, perspective, which is creating a, a liberating technology that will preserve liberty, uh, in the digital age, right? And that's, that, that for me, that was like the real sales. Like when I get, that's my understanding of it. The true value proposition of what this stuff's supposed to be is that it preserves individuality and, and, and liberty in the digital age. And it's something that will allow us to transact freely, essentially preserving free speech. Um, and if something like Bitcoin takes hold, which is a surveillance coin, uh, it's not going to usher in that ever error of uh, preserve liberty in the digital age. In fact, it's going to be quite the opposite, and it's potentially much worse of a scenario than what we currently have. I mean, imagine uh, a world living in a world where every transaction you make and your friends make and your family makes is 100% completely surveilled and tracked by large companies and by governments around the world. I mean, it's a scary proposition. And that's why I think we should be getting the word out and calling it a, a spade a spade, even if it, it hurts people's feelings. The Bitcoin maximalists have have no have no problem calling things shit coins, you know, <laughs> and I, yeah. I, 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 you know, so we should be calling you know, uh, Bitcoin for what it is. So, so people, buyer beware. People need to know what they're buying. You know, they need to know what this technology is. Uh, it's being sold as this great liberator. And, uh, I just don't really see how it could possibly be that when it's effectively, um, a surveillance tool. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I will, I will try to, I already discuss this, uh, like I've gotten into arguments with people and I do think it should be, people should be made aware of it. I myself was getting, I mean, I have been getting a little bit excited lately because people seem to be talking about it again. They, they seem to be talking about issues with Bitcoin and privacy, but I don't know if they care enough about it more than like their wallets and, you know, having loyalty to the coins that they already have promoted or liked to really try to solve these issues. And I definitely take an issue with people who promote Bitcoin, which I was so surprised when I saw this, but I, I got into an argument with someone recently because they were saying that Bitcoin was anonymous. And I was like, no, it's not. Like <laughs> This is already established. Like, no, it's not. And like, I don't get into Twitter arguments very often. And I, I definitely got into that one because I was like, this to me, this is so obvious. And I was like, it's pseudo anonymous and trying to explain. And to the very end, they were like, oh, it's just a word thing. And I was like, no, this is pretty established. You know, like a, a wallet address is, is pseudo anonymous. It's not anonymous. And so there are people out there. And this particular person had a pretty good following, which you get very quickly on Twitter. If you're mean to other people, that, that seems like the, the best way to get a large following. And he was one of those people and I was, you know, kind of arguing with him about it. So I, I am very concerned about that. And something else I'm kind of concerned about, even though I like the effort and I want to know your opinion on this is people who are promoting third, well, not necessarily third party, but sometimes third party mixing services or even like the Wasabi wallet with Bitcoin. Because to me, if you don't have privacy at the protocol level, then that's not good enough. But at the same time, I'm like kind of happy that they're trying you know, to do something. So like, what do you think, think about specifically this, these solutions that people who are Bitcoin maximalists who say, oh, let's just use a second layer solution for this issue. I don't think it should be a second layer solution, but I also don't see so many people who are already into Bitcoin changing their minds. So if they're going to stick with it, then it's better that they have that. So like, what do you think about that? Uh, once again, I mean, I, I, I kind of ultimately think it's, it's, it's irresponsible, uh, just like it's irresponsible to go out and promote Bitcoin for being this great, uh, liberating technology, um, and it's digital cash or it's digital gold when it's lacking fundamental aspects. I think it's irresponsible to go out and say, Hey, you know what? It's, 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 it's okay to use Bitcoin as long as you do X, Y, and Z. So, you know, it may not, 
you know, we, we realize it's not perfect, it's not private, but just use these other things and it'll make it private. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I, the people that are working on those projects, great, because I mean, they're, they're pushing, um, they're trying to implement privacy into Bitcoin. So by all means, uh, if anything, I think it will ultimately, um, expose the, the flaws of Bitcoin and people will realize that, well, they should just be using a true crypto. So, I mean, um, I think, I think that's great. I think. Uh, but I think it's like, you know, trying to put lipstick on a pig, right? So it's like, it's broken. It's fundamentally flawed. Uh, instead of just, you know, fixing it, uh, which you really can't do at this point, I believe, right? It's going to be very hard to implement fungibility into Bitcoin on a protocol level. It just doesn't seem like that's going to happen politically within the, you know, uh, the 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 uh, political system of, of Bitcoin and crypto land there. I don't think you're going to see that happen. You're not going to get the consensus to truly make Bitcoin fungible. So because that can happen, they're trying to put a bandaid on it and use these things like third party mixing services. And I think, you know, like it's, it's great that people are working on that tech because but it's also irresponsible, I think, to promote it because people are going to get burned. I mean, you're going to go, you're going to use these third party mixing services um, and it's going to come back to bite you. Uh, we've already seen that happen with people. I mean, there was, I forget the name of the third party mixing service that was recently cracked down upon. I don't know if you, if, if you know the name. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I should know this. I forget the, I forget the, it happened about two weeks ago. A, a major one got um, uh, the, you know, their, they're being they're, the guy who started it, I think, is uh, is uh, being charged with with money laundering uh, for hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, uh, it was being used to essentially mix Bitcoin. So then those Bitcoins can be used to make purchases uh, on the dark web. And now he's being charged with uh, money laundering. Uh -huh. um, and, you know that that's an issue, you yeah. know? So people that are using these, these, these mixers, these third party mixers, uh, may, you know, they may get in trouble. They may, they may think what they're doing is a good thing that they're cleaning their, cleaning their Bitcoin. Uh, but what are they really doing? They're mixing it with a bunch of other dirty Bitcoin. I mean, nobody's using those things unless they think their Bitcoin need to be cleaned in the first place. Right. So it's a bunch of people that think they need to clean their Bitcoin are all mixing their their Bitcoin together. Um, I mean, unless you could try to get everybody to do it and that's just not going to work. That's why you need it to be private and fungible by default, right? Which is essentially what something like Monero is. So it's not like where you have a third party thing that you can selectively use and opt into. It's that by default, everything is fungible and, and essentially mixed together, right? Making it fungible. Um, so yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a good, I don't think it's a solution. I don't think it's going to work for Bitcoin. Um, you know, exchanges don't, don't know what to do about it. Right. So if they see, we were seeing this already. So, uh, you know, if they, if they're using chain analysis and, and if they see that your Bitcoins went through, um, a, a mixer, they, they may not accept your Bitcoins on the exchange. You know, that that's happening. That's that's real. You know, that's real. Um, so that's just showing you that Bitcoin actually isn't fungible. Right. Because they're allowing some coins on the exchange. They're not allowing other coins. Some coins are clean. Some coins are dirty. Um, and to try to clean them with these uh, third party technologies, I think, is kind of a dangerous game. But it's ulti but ultimately, I think it's okay because it's just going to show the the true value of something like Monero that doesn't require those third party services. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's just a waiting game um, where you know, like you said, maybe the flaws will be exposed and then people will decide to look for other solutions. You brought up something that I was maybe going to touch on, um, which was you had said that uh, privacy. Well. Uh, a true crypto in your terms um, would have privacy by default. And something that I think about when it comes to privacy coins is 
because the technology is so new, they like, I wrote a temple on privacy coins and something I very quickly discovered was that there's so many things that can go wrong. And one of those things is that even if your technology, the protocol provides privacy, if you don't have enough transactions on the chain, then you don't really have privacy. You, you don't have, uh, they call it a large anonymity set, which I'm sure you know what that means. Um, but at the same time, if it's just a matter of time before this particular cryptocurrency gains enough volume to provide better privacy, then would you say like this privacy coin is no good because they in practical because it does in because it's in practicality doesn't have privacy because it doesn't have enough volume. But if it did, the protocol would be sound. Like, what do you think about how you assess the fitness of a privacy coin in terms of providing privacy if it in theory has privacy, but then it, in practicality for reasons like the volume, for example, doesn't. Because to me, I don't call any privacy coin like the best privacy coin or whatever, because it's hard to decide if you're going to focus on the theory or if you're going to focus on the practicality of it. For example, with the, the volume or, for example, I had a conversation with uh, someone from Dash and they were saying, well, Bitcoin doesn't have great privacy if you're using something like CoinJoin, but because it has really large volume, that might actually in effect, in effect be better than something like Particle, which has Ring CT, but it doesn't have a huge community and then not all of these are using, using the chain. Like, what do you think about, to me, that's complicated. Like, like what do you think about that? Um, so you're, you're basically saying that, you know, different privacy coins have different pros and cons and there is no, there is no best privacy coin. So, I mean, I just find, I don't know. I mean, it's my opinion, but I'm wondering like what your take on it is because to me, it's like, how do you, it's like trying to. It's trying to say what something is before it's fully developed, almost. If that, for, to me at least, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's um, you know, while I'm uh, you know I'm very pro Monero. Like I said, I'm a I'm a digital cash maximalist, so I don't like to call myself a Monero maximalist. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's hard for me not to become one. You know, it's, it's I'm trying. I try to stay. Um, you know, unbiased, um, you know, and have an open mind about other projects. So I'm really trying to do that because I think that's important, right? Uh, that's why I think things like Bitcoin maximalism is, is just, it's just not, it's not good. It's not, you know, it's, it's not honest, right? So, I mean, if you're, if you're treating this like an experiment, then you should maintain an open mind and realize, uh, that there, you know, nothing is perfect yet. Uh, nothing will ever be perfect, uh, right? And maintain an open mind so you can decide, you know, at which project is the best. And currently, when I measure all things up, I, I think Monero really, you know, takes takes the cake. I mean, it's uh, it for all its different reasons. I think it is the truest cryptocurrency, and it's it's currently acting the, as the best as as digital cash. Now, if you look at it. At its separate little part. So collectively as a whole, I think it's the best. I think it's the best form of digital cash we have um, because of its technology, because it's actually being used by people for the purposes of fungible uh, value transfer on the internet. Like you're seeing it actually actively being used on dark nets and dark webs. Whether or not you agree with what people are doing there, I think that shows that it's that it's usable for that purpose. Um, it has liquidity uh, because you're seeing people actually use it. Um, it has low fees so people can actually transact with it. You know, it's not like just digital gold and it's just sitting there and you can't actually use it. Um, it's, uh, it has things built into it that will allow it to scale. Uh, we could get into that if you want to get into that. Uh, and then in terms of its, its privacy or its fungibility, um, it has all these, these different tool attributes that allow it to effectively act as digital cash today. Now, the thing is, you know, 
five years from now, that may not be the case. Like technology may catch up to it and be able to um, expose its flaws, you know, because it's not perfect technology. But what's great about Monero is it's it's a dynamic project. Uh, it upgrades every six months and the entire Monero ecosystem all believes in this value proposition of creating digital cash. Everybody who's working on Monero and in Monero wants Monero to be fungible digital cash. In Bitcoin, that's the messaging is not very clear, right? Some people are like, oh, the fa you know, well, some people tell you, you know, actually Bitcoin is fungible. It's clearly not, but they'll say it is. Some people say, well, it's not fungible, but who cares? I mean, you know, maybe you don't need it to be fungible or, you know, it's actually even better that it's not because of X, Y, and Z, you know, uh, at least, you know, ex you know, exchanges are okay with using it. If it was, if it was fungible, exchanges wouldn't want to use it. So there's all, the, all these different things in Monero. It's very clear. Listen, Hey, we're trying to be true a true cryptocurrency. We're trying to be digital cash no matter what. We, we've achieved it as of today and we realize that we have to continue to work on the project to improve it because privacy is a, is a continuing, it's a, not, a non-stop battle, right? So you need to stay ahead of your adversaries that are, that are essentially trying to uh, decrypt your, you know, your, your, your cryptocurrency and, unra and unravel it. So I think Monero has achieved it today. And more importantly, is that they're committed to upgrading and trying to maintain that. So like one of the flaws that people would bring up are, uh, is, uh, you know, confidential, uh, ring signatures, right? So, um, that that's like, you know, uh, that that's not like the most ideal tech, right? Like, um, that you know uh, the anonymity set isn't uh, isn't essentially you know infinite with that, and you know with enough heuristics things can be un unraveled. And today, practically speaking, it works and it works well. Uh, but in the future, that sh that should change. That should be improved. And Monero is actively doing that. It has the Monero Research Lab. There's already, you know, three proposals on the table for how it could potentially be improved, what could be swapped out and upgraded. So, yes, to, it, you know, I do think some coins are better at certain things than others. But if you look at the the all the attributes of the coin and you're trying to pick the one that today is the best form of digital cash, I think that is... Monero, even though something like Zcash may have, you know, these zero knowledge proofs built, you know, for its purposes of uh, hiding the, the transaction value and, you know, uh, the sender and receiver and in theory may, in mathematical theory, may seem to be better than Monero in practical, in, in, in Practically speaking, uh, Zcash isn't better, right? Because it's a trusted setup. So it's like it's flawed from the get-go. Um, it's, uh, you know, opt-in privacy. It's it's not even private by default. So like they've made their, you know, they've sacrificed different things. So every project is going to like sacrifice some things and adopt some things. Um, so, but I think Monero has done a really good job at uh, making the correct design decisions. And most importantly, designing for the purpose of always being digital, fungible digital cash. I think if you ask the Z, some Zcash people, I'm not entirely sure that that's the mission of the project because they clearly haven't achieved that. I mean, they were okay with the trusted setup from the, from the get go. They were okay with having opt in privacy. I mean, how do you, how are you digital cash if some of your coins are private and some of them are not, you know, like you've already lost there, you know? So I think Monero is like, let's be digital cash and let's use the te the best tech that we have today to do that. I don't know if that, does it, that it, answer your really, question? Yeah, it, it answers it. It answers it. So it's really interesting hearing you talk to me because I personally don't like the trust that up either, but I was just talking to someone from Pivx, and they use technology from, well, first Dash as a governance, but what Zcash is using, and they were explaining to me like their solutions for the trusted setup. And I was like, I'd have to be really, 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 really convinced. But if you guys do manage to do that, and also it's that process is transparent, then maybe 
that could solve some of the issues that I, I happen to trust and set up. Um, it's just very interesting hearing it because that person from Pivx is like very into that community and it's like a, a different mindset, even though the overarching goal of, of privacy uh, is the same. Um, I want to ask you about what recent developments have happened in Monero because from what I know, Monero uses Ring CT and they have uh, the last development I, I personally researched had to do with the bulletproof upgrade, which happened the last year, I think a long time ago, um, to make having privacy easier to achieve because it costs less to get it done. And like what new has occurred since then or like what's what's new about Monero? I consider Monero to be like a very pioneering is the word that I use as the word I use in, in the book, um, privacy coins. So I think you it's very good that there's a research lab, like things are really tested and you have very good cryptographers working on it. Um, and I think that's not as a, that is more appealing to me than when coins don't have that kind of research behind it and can possibly respond very quickly in case something breaks to like deal with the, the protocol. But um, what's new in, in Monero? Oh, I can't hear you. I'm For sorry. Reason, the, uh, the biggest okay. thing, the biggest thing is random X. So I don't know if you're familiar with oh, that. Yeah. Are you familiar with random? I just heard the term, but I don't. Can you explain it? Um, so brief. Yeah. So so random X. So like I said. So so Bitcoin Monero's. You know, uh, a mission is to be digital cash, right? So it, to achieve that, uh, you, you know, you need to you need to be you know fungible, um, but you need to uh, also maintain, make sure you maintain a decentralized network, right? Because that's, what's going to allow you, um, to essentially be censorship resistant, right? Um, that's, what's going to, uh, you know, if, if your system's not decentralized, it's not a true cryptocurrency. You, these things need to be decentralized. That's what's allowing them to be censorship resistant. Um, so, in in Bitcoin, we're seeing things centralized because of ASICs, right? I mean, people may argue otherwise, but the the fact is, I mean, uh, I forget what the oh. stat is. It's something like you know, sixty percent of all uh, mining is in China. I think it might be more than that. I think it's uh, like two thirds of all two thirds of all mining is in China. Uh, essentially, is this four four companies that are mining all all the Bitcoin. Um, and you know, there's how many companies that actually produce the ASICs? It's like I don't know, one or one or two. So I mean, the um, the Bitcoin mining industry is is has become more centralized over the years, and that's putting it at risk, right? Because I mean, that's like the fundamental aspect of what this needs to be. It's not, you know, it needs to be decentralized if it's going to be censorship resistant. So Monero is committed to. Uh, staying decentralized and as part of that they see the need to be ASIC resistant for now because I, I want to clarify that I mean eventually ASICs on uh, Monero may be okay uh, once once it's realized or thought that it won't lead toward central centralization but as of today uh, ASIC mining seems to be leading towards centralization uh, so Monero implemented this thing called a proof of, to cha it changes proof of work to what's called Random X, and it was designed by Howard Chu, uh, who's a you know a Monero contributor. Um, uh, you know you should you should Google him. I mean he's he's has like a really smart guy. He's done uh, amazing things outside of cryptocurrency as well. He's he's you know you know very very well very well known. Um, he. He created this, and it's kind of it's kind of a breakthrough, uh, and it, it seems to be working. And it's basically what it's what it's done is it's turned the CPU into the ASIC for Monero. So the most efficient way, essentially, to mine Monero right now is with a computer, is with a CPU. Uh, so that's uh, ensures the decentral decentralized network for Monero because now the most efficient way to to mine Monero is with a CPU, uh, not with an ASIC. So that means, you know, you it, 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 in addition to keeping it censorship resistant, it also ensures that the network is more permission, you know, is truly permissionless, 
right? You know, if, if I'm in Venezuela and I want to get involved in the Bitcoin network and start mining Bitcoin, I, I need an ASIC, you know? I, I may be getting free electricity, uh, but I pr practically speaking, I need an ASIC to compete and actually mine something, right? There's no way I'm going to be able to, to mine cryptocurrency uh, without ASICs. Uh, but you can be in Venezuela and if you could access a CPU and you could access electricity, uh, you can join the Monero network. You can join the Monero network anywhere in the world where there's electricity and there's CPUs and uh, everybody has a CPU in this day and age, you know. Um, not everybody has an ASIC yet. Uh, maybe in the future. And at that point, I think the idea is then Monero would be open to allowing that. You know, uh, so that that's kind of that was like, the, I think, the biggest breakthrough in Monero. And one of the biggest breakthroughs, I would, I think, in 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 the cryptocurrency sphere. And it's a, what amazes me. A lot of people don't talk about it. I had um, Andreas Antonopoulos on the show and he didn't know about Random X. He didn't he didn't know. He didn't, know, don't so know, about he didn't know that Monero had uh, had already implemented confidential transactions in in uh, yeah, people don't know anything. It's it's like it's a very weird space in terms of the information. Yeah, and, you know, I, I get he's a busy guy and he's yeah. focused on Bitcoin, but he's also focused on selling Bitcoin as being this thing that's yeah. that's that's censorship resistant. Uh, that's you know digital cash. That's digital gold. Uh, actually, I don't think he likes to call it digital yeah. gold. But I mean, he sorry, sorry, he's sorry. there and he's talking about this this technology where it has these flaws, and meanwhile, there's something that that's actually doing what he's hoping this technology is achieving. And uh, he doesn't really know much, much about it. So yeah, I would say that's the biggest thing. The other thing is like I was saying, um, upgrading components, uh, uh, the ring signature. So Triptych is something that Monero is looking at. It hasn't been implemented yet. If you do some Googling there, um, that, you know, the Monero Research Lab is, uh, you know, looking into whether or not, um, I guess it checks all the boxes in terms of, uh, you know, there's going to be any um, sacrifices made with implementing it. But it looks like that may get implemented as well. And that will add additional uh, privacy uh, to Monero, essentially improving the anonymity set. Okay. So I say those okay. are Sorry. kind of like the two big things that are happening right now. Yeah, yeah, that's really important for me to know. Um, so you were just talking about um, Andreas Antonopoulos um, not knowing about confidential transactions in Monero. And I remember when Litecoin, that doesn't really do any development, there were Charlie Lee, I think it was, was like Wayne adding confidential transactions. And it was like, everybody was, was like, oh, this is so awesome. And it just, it, it like kind of deflates anybody who's like involved in privacy and cryptocurrencies and understands like, well, people have been building this and trying to promote it and nobody cares. The whole cryptocurrency space, a lot of the times, it just feels like inertia and nobody cares anymore about people developing things and doing all this work and trying to solve this problem. It just, your, your voice is only important if you were there in the beginning and everybody got to know you and then like, oh, I guess you're, you're done now caring about like what's new out there because it's all like scams and <laughs> everything else and it's very disheartening and like in some ways it's true like this is the scammiest industry i have ever seen in my life like it's it's like honestly kind of crazy like how many people are always trying to scam me and it's like i'm like a nobody like why are you trying to talk to me so i get that like that's that's true and that exists but it's also it's not cool when you're building say like this i'm going to talk about it but like this decentralized marketplace that is something that was in the original bitcoin white paper and people are like oh that's cool and then they disappear it's like you don't you don't actually care <laughs> you know and that, that's how the, the whole space feels sometimes but, um yeah i i guess i know what you mean if, if you want you can comment on that uh yeah i mean you know it's it's it Crypto is the wild west, but that's also what makes it amazing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, that's why you're seeing so much innovation. Uh, you're going to see a ton of scams as well because it's just literally open free market. Um, people are just out there. They, you know, they can, it's all open source, right? They can just 
grab the code and launch their own version of it. And uh, you're going to see a lot of snake oil salesmen out there because it's just, you know, with social media, it's easy to just pump these things up and like fool people into thinking it, you know, that some, certain things have value. And to really understand these things, it takes time. I mean, you know, since buying my first Dogecoin in 2013, I've been looking at this stuff every day in great detail, you know, for like, I don't know how many hours a day, you know, I have my full-time, my, my full-time job, but when I'm not there, I'm, I'm, I'm in crypto, I'm looking at crypto and, you know, even for me, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard, right? I mean, you too, right? You're, you're putting, you, I'm sure you put a ton of time into this. So you can imagine people who aren't putting this amount of time into it and they're just out there on the internet, they're on Twitter or whatever, and they hear a project and somebody says, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, literally in a tweet as to why it's so great. And uh, <laughs> they don't have the time to go research and they're just, they're just fooled. So yeah, you're going to see a lot of that. But I think that's just an indication of how, how open this market is and how, how much of a, a wild west it is, which I think is great, which I love about crypto. Um, so yeah, you're going to have the bad with the good, but uh, I do think the wild west nature of it is, is exciting. Yeah, that's a positive way to look at it. Um, one more question I have for you is uh, sort of a comment and then a question. So I also think it's really strange how Bitcoin drew from this cypherpunk kind of ideal and it's slowly morphing into like literally the opposite of that. Um, where do you see the space going? I, I, I can tell you for myself that I see like, I hope that it's either like the whole decentralization kills everything else or somehow they coexist side by side with like people who hold ideas like yourself, like privacy for human right, having coins like Monero exist, um, alongside the surveillance coins, as you call them. Um, but where do you see it going in the future? I mean, you know, my, my hope is that, and I, I do feel like it's inevitable that something like Monero will really take hold and yeah. uh, maybe become like the number two coin. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, Monero, uh, Bitcoin has the network effect. Um, I don't think that, you know, Bitcoin's network effect, though, makes it inevitable that it's forever going to be the one and only uh, crypto. I, I, I certainly don't believe in that argument. I think that's, we've, we've never seen that in, 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 in humankind. I mean, I understand these network effects, it's money, it's, it, 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 there's efficiency reasons for why it, it would make sense if everybody's using one money, but we, we don't all speak the same language today. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, it would be, you know, it would be highly efficient if we were all, you know, speaking English and not another language, but that's just not the case. It's not human nature. We're, yeah. Um, so, I mean, f I just see, sure. you know, I think there's going to be one or two coins that, that are going to kind of rule them all. Uh, you know, <laughs> there'll be like, you know, maybe like four coins. I don't know. And everything else is, sure. is pretty much going to be insignificant. Um, and, you know, I think there's going to be this like transitional period with, with a crypto like Monero where people are going to be like, oh, I'm scared of Monero because, because it's private. Uh, you know, maybe it's going to get regulated out of existence and exchanges aren't going to yeah. use it. So, I mean, even if there's like a dark, you know, a dark ages where like only Bitcoin is being used in on exchanges, I think that's just going to. Essentially, I see Bitcoin as kind of being the thing that's going to onboard everybody from the fiat world is like maybe one of the ways I'm yeah. looking at it. Like it's the conduit from the yeah. fiat world. And then once people are in crypto, they'll go into true crypto, uh, into a true crypto like Monero. Okay. I guess that, that makes some kind of sense. I don't know right? how long you want this to be, but I, I say, I guess that makes it makes sense. Um, uh, but I just want to, before I go tell your audience, uh, because they're probably really into Monero about particle, not the coin too much in detail. It's, it's ring CT. Um, it's very, thoroughly vetted they do audits and stuff but it uses proof of stake and it's a fork of bitcoin so it's ring ct implemented on the bitcoin code base versus crypto note with monero um but the bigger thing i want to say is that the there's a decentralized marketplace 
um, that can be downloaded. It's decentralized because it's, it's built on top of the, like, the blockchain as a platform. And then the blockchain, there, there's like a wallet client, multiple wallets, and one specific wallet connects to an SMSG database that has all the listed information on there. And it might just be something that is interesting to people who are into Monero because it's private and it's censorship resistant. Um, because all the transactions on the marketplace are anonymous, but for the currency, just as a token itself, it's optional. But for all the marketplace transactions, it's anonymous. It doesn't use any third party. Um, governance is done by if a certain number of users flag an item on the marketplace, it gets taken down. And um, there's no moderation between a buyer and a seller. It uses an escrow system. They call it mutually assured destruction escrow. So you put up extra funds and both the buyer and seller put up extra funds and you don't get your extra money back until the buyer says that um i the buyer sends the sends the item and the sorry the seller sends the item and the buyer says i've received it and they're incentivized to not lie because they want their extra money back right now that's one to one but that might change in the future it's just something i it's like monero people would probably be interested in that right now um it uses particles so you would need particle you can use Bitcoin. That's the first coin that they added, but it uses a simple swap. So it uses an exchange bot. They want it to be atomic swaps. And I think that's being worked on, but I don't know when that's going to happen because it's actually really hard to do from what I understand. And they're going to be adding more coins in the future. Right now, you can literally download the client and use Bitcoin and you can buy and sell on there. And it's it's not the only thing out there. Um, there's Open Bazaar, but Open Bazaar isn't a cryptocurrency, and it also has third-party moderation, which particle the particle marketplace doesn't have. So it's exciting. I uh, presented it to uh, like the people in the Free State Project, and they were really into it. And I think anyone who has that like philosophical, you know, my my sovereignty, um, they might be interested in the fact that that platform is out there. It looks really good. <laughs> it has a nice GUI. Yeah, uh, very cool. I mean, yeah, I don't know much about it. Uh, how many people are, is it being is it being used? Not very much. I think, I don't, I can't tell you exactly how many. I, I think there are a couple hundred listings on the marketplace, but I don't know how many transactions are going back and forth. I don't think it's a lot. And it was released fall last year, I think like October or something. I have a video the mainnet was released so not very much but it's it's new so hopefully it will grow over time yeah. cool that's exciting um yeah. yeah i encourage you know people research that check that out i don't know much about particle only from uh meeting you at magical crypto conference and like the quick the quick pitch you gave to me there uh, so I guess I'm yeah. sounding like Andrea Antonopoulos now because I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't have time to to, <laughs> to look into that. Uh, but it's true. I mean, that's the thing. You, everybody only has so much time in the day, and then they kind of get stuck in their own silos, uh, which is unfortunate. So uh, yeah, encourage people to uh, research as many different, you know, projects as they can, as long as they're not wasting their time with with scam projects, you know. Um, but yeah, particle, I would. If I have the time, I'll, I'll, I'll go check it out more deeply as well. <laughs> How long has it been around for, Particle? Uh, well, it started as Shadow Cash in 2014. So that was original. It was community funded. And then they did a token swap in 2017, um, a one-to-one -one token swap to Particle. So like the, the team has been around since 2014, and they just finished building this thing. Like They were always trying to build a private decentralized marketplace and it finally happened years later um and it was it's all community funded uh, there's a foundation in switzerland that holds the funds um it's a non-profit foundation kind of like the i think ethereum foundation actually i take that back i'm not sure of the technicalities but there's a non-profit foundation uh, in switzerland um and i think I can't tell you the exact number, but because the bull run happened, there were a lot more funds that came out, but it was all community, it was all individual people donating to it. It's just, there's no company or anything like that. So what, what do, what do I, I, I was just going to ask one more question. What do people in particle, uh, 
um, think of Monero, like a lot of the the particle, the big particle users and the community. I mean, do they have an opinion of Monero? I'd, I'd be interested to hear what that is. I mean, I can tell you that I like Monero, but I don't. I don't know. I've never. I don't really hear people say anything bad, and I, I think it wouldn't make sense because, like, it uses Ring CT. Like that's the same thing Monero uses. It's just a little bit different. But the actual privacy features, it's it's Ring CT. Like when after you guys did the bulletproofs, like Particle did bulletproofs, like you know. So I I would it would be very weird if if there was like hostility because it wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say I, I'm promoting myself just because of, I think the conversation is going to end soon. That I have a book on privacy coins. I can't tell you that Monero is spoken of highly, like well in there. Um, that's not a reason to get the book. And for some people, it might be knowledge you already know. It just goes through like the history, like when CryptoNote came out and then zero coins, zero cash protocols. It mentions Mimblewimble and, uh, um, something called ZEXE. I don't know how to pronounce it. And then it gives my opinion also. But the first part is all just research based. And then the second and third parts are more like my opinion. And my handle is Crypto Ramble. You find me on Twitter and you'll find links to the book. It's on Amazon, the Privacy Coin Guide, and or on my website. And you, you see all that, that stuff if you go and look. Awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for letting me come on your show and you coming on my show. This is, this is great. I know this is a long time in the coming since Magical Crypto Conference. <laughs> I know. It's been a year. We've been trying to set it up. Um, do, do you want to tell people where to find you as well? I mean, I'll put like a link in the description, but it's better to have it like in the audio and video. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Monero Talk, Monero Talk uh, YouTube channel uh, is the best. You know, that's, that's where we do a weekly show there. Um, and Monero Talk on Twitter and at Chowbunga Man is my personal uh, Twitter. Um, yeah, that's, I think those are the important ones. Okay. Well, I really hope, I don't know, especially with all this coronavirus stuff, like, I don't know what's going to happen in May, but maybe I'll see you at, in NYC um, for MCC, for the Magical Crypto Conference. I don't know if they're having it in May again, but. It will be nice to, to run into you again. And thank you also for having me on uh, Monero Talk. Awesome. It was great talking to you. And let's uh, stay in touch. Okay. All right. Ciao. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.